Welcome to Spooky Pasta, the place where your worst nightmares come to life. Today's story is a six-part series by Paige Turner 627 over on the subreddit No Sleep. So let's get into our story. I'm a cop on the Navajo reservation. I investigated a killer who steals his victim's skin, part one. The desert stretches out as far as the eye can see. There's a haunting beauty to it that few can appreciate. But for me, it's home. My name's Logan, Logan Tohani. I'm an officer with the Navajo Nation Police Department, and this vast expanse is my beat. The towering mesas stand as silent witnesses to everything that happens here. Some of it good, a lot of it bad. In my 10 years as a cop on the reservation, I've seen my fair share of both. Every day, I'm responsible for patrolling a staggering 70 square miles of tribal land in Arizona. An area so vast, I often feel like a mere speck moving against a colossal backdrop. It's a lonely job, with most of my days punctuated only by the hum of my cruiser's engine and the sporadic chirp of the radio. Yet, despite the isolation, I wear my badge with immense pride. To me, it's not just a symbol of authority. It's a beacon of hope, a sign that someone is looking out for the the people of the res. I consider myself more than just a cop. I am a guardian of a culture that stretches back into time immemorial. The stories my parents and grandparents told of our ancestors, warriors who stood watch over their clans, resonate with me. In some ways, I see my role as an extension of that legacy. But there's a flip side to that coin. The desolation, the lack of opportunities, and the scars of history have left many of my people struggling. The daily problems my people face aren't always the stuff of headlines, but they're very real. Poverty is a constant specter, with many families lacking basic necessities. Jobs are scarce, and with them, the hope of a brighter future. Many of our youth feel trapped, suffocated by limited opportunities and the weight of history. Substance abuse is another demon we grapple with. The allure of drugs and alcohol, often seen as an escape, is a cruel trick that has ensnared too many of our kin. The weight of intergenerational trauma is crushing, yet through it all, the enduring spirit of the dying remains unbroken, facing each challenge with quiet resilience. The vastness of my patrol zone means that I am often the only line of defense for many miles law enforcement is stretched thin, resources scarce. Help, if it comes, is often hours away. Backup is a luxury I rarely get. And so, each time I respond to a call, I know that I am all they have. Today started like any other. A sunrise painting the sky in hues of gold and crimson. But as the sun climbed higher, the radio crackled to life, piercing the morning stillness. Unit 17, do you copy? The radio's abrupt intrusion into the morning stillness startles me for a moment. My hand instinctively reaches for the microphone. This is Unit 17, go ahead. I reply, my voice steady as I glance out at the seemingly endless desert landscape stretching before me. Logan, it's Mandy. The voice on the other end crackles with familiarity. Mandy is one of the few people I interact with regularly on this desolate beat. She's the dispatcher, the lifeline that connects me to the outside world, and sometimes the only friendly voice I hear for hours. Hey, Mandy, what's going on? I ask, my curiosity peaked. We've got a 419 she says, her tone somber. The code for 19, it's not something we hear every day. It means a dead body has been found. Where at? I inquire, my grip on the steering will tightening. Near Tseji, just off the old dirt road. Caller said it looks like foul play. Could be a homicide. I nod, even though she can't see me. Tseji isn't too far from where I am, relatively speaking. But out here, distances can be deceiving. I'm on my way, Mandy. 
As I navigate my cruiser over the rugged terrain, my thoughts race. A homicide on the reservation is rare, but it's not unheard of. The stark reality of life here means that conflicts can escalate quickly, often without witnesses. I prepare myself mentally for what lies ahead. The sun hangs high and unrelenting as I navigate the cruiser over the dusty roads, wheels crunching on the loose gravel. The farther I go, the more the familiar landmarks fade, replaced by isolated rock formations that have stood there for millennia. The site near Tseji is tucked away in a secluded canyon, a perfect spot for someone trying to hide dark deeds. As I pull up, two figures are visible under the shade of a mesquite tree. I recognize them instantly. It's June and Eddie Begay, an older couple I've known since childhood. They often hike these canyons. Taking photographs and collecting herbs, I slow down my cruiser and step out, putting on a pair of sunglasses to shield my eyes against the bright sun. The orange-brown dust settles around my boots as I approach June and Eddie. Young Eddie, I greet them in Navajo, giving a slight nod. Eddie looks up, his face etched with deep lines that speak of years spent under the desert sun. His eyes, however, tell a story of something more recent and troubling. Yaw Addy, Logan, he responds, his voice heavy with concern. It's bad. June's face mirrors her husband's unease, her lips pressed into a thin line. She clutches a woven basket close to her, filled with sage and other herbs she's picked. We didn't expect to find anything like this, she murmurs, her eyes downcast. I nod solemnly, understanding the gravity of their words. Show me, I request, my voice barely above a whisper. Eddie leads the way, his steps deliberate and slow. As we navigate through the maze of rocks, the unmistakable scent of decay grows stronger. I brace myself for the sight. The scene that unfolds before me is worse than I could have imagined. The desert, for all its vastness and silence, often reveals horrors. But this, this is something else entirely. The body lies spread eagle on the sun-baked ground, its skin grotesquely removed, revealing raw muscle and sinew. There are symbols crudely carved into the flesh, symbols that look hauntingly familiar, resonating with the ancient tales I've heard about since childhood. I swallow hard, pushing down the bile that rises in my throat. Despite the cruelty on display, the body seems to have been positioned with a deliberate purpose. Each limb points in a specific direction, aligning with the cardinal points on a compass. Small piles of desert stones have been meticulously arranged around the body in a circle. At the head was a cluster of wild sage, still fresh with morning dew indicating the killer had returned to the scene to place it there. The Begays stand a distance away, trying to shield themselves from the gruesome scene. Their eyes, however, betray a deep-seated fear and recognition. Eddie finally breaks the silence. This isn't just a murder, Logan. He murmurs, his voice quivering. It's a ritual, one we've not seen in a long, long time. I look at Eddie, then back to the body, trying to decipher the meaning behind the symbols and arrangements. What do you know? I ask. June clears her throat, hesitating. We've heard whispers among the elders. She begins, her voice tinged with sadness. Many of our kids, they feel trapped, lost. Some of them have turned to the old ways, not out of respect, but as a form of rebellion as a means to escape. I frown, thinking about the substance abuse issues on the res. You mean they're getting involved in drugs? Eddie catches my expression. Not drugs, Logan. This isn't about that. June nods in agreement. This is about dark magic, forbidden rites. Some of the youth are delving into things they shouldn't, trying to harness ancient powers for their own gains. And you think this. I gesture to the mutilated body, is the result of one of those rituals? June looks at the ground, 
a tear escaping her eye. The symbols, the positioning, it's reminiscent of the old sacrificial rites, but it's been twisted, warped. I raise an eyebrow, skeptical. Every generation has its rebels. The youth nowadays face challenges we can't even imagine. But to think they're responsible for something as sinister as this, it's a stretch. It's unfair. June's eyes well up with tears. We're not blaming them, but someone's dabbling in things best left alone, and we fear for what might be unleashed. I exhale slowly, processing what they're telling me. The thought of ancient rites and forbidden ceremonies, though deeply rooted in our culture, feels distant in the modern age. Look, I start, choosing my words carefully. I can see the concern etched into their weathered faces. I'll handle this, I assure them gently. You two should head back home. It's not safe out here, not until I can figure out what happened. Eddie nods slowly, but June hesitates, her eyes lingering on the gruesome scene. Logan, she says, her voice quivering, be careful. There's something very wrong about this. I nod, giving them both a reassuring look. I'll get to the bottom of it. Just go home and lock your doors until we have answers. After watching them disappear in the direction they came from, I reach for my radio, dialing the station. This is Tohani, near Tseji. Confirmed 419. It's, it's bad. I need backup and forensics. Mandy's voice crackles back, a sense of urgency layered within her usually steady tone. Got it, Logan. I'll get the team together. But, if it's as you describe, we'll need to notify the feds. A heavy sigh escapes my lips. The FBI is involved in any serious crimes occurring on the reservation. Their presence is always a reminder of the strained relationship between the Navajo Nation and the federal government. It's a complex tapestry of past betrayals, the fight for sovereignty, and the ongoing quest for justice. While I understand the protocol, there's an inherent wariness in inviting them onto our land. It often feels like an intrusion, a stark reminder that in many ways, we're still not in complete control of our destinies. I figured as much, I respond, resignation in my voice. Make the call, Mandy. I park the cruiser strategically to shield the body from prying eyes, then retrieve the crime scene tape from the trunk. Securing the perimeter is a delicate process, especially when it involves uneven terrain and scattered shrubbery. With each stake I drive into the ground, a cloud of dust kicks up, hanging momentarily in the still air before slowly settling. With the perimeter secured, I gingerly approach the body once more. Even after years on the job, it's never easy seeing someone in this state, especially knowing it was deliberate, an act committed by another human. I snap pictures from various angles, ensuring I capture every detail. The symbols carved into the flesh might be the key to figuring out what happened here, and I'm determined not to miss a thing. As I document the scene, the desert silence is almost suffocating. The monotonous hum of distant cicadas is the only reminder that life exists beyond this gruesome tableau. The sun is ruthless, casting elongated shadows that seem to stretch endlessly across the arid landscape. Every now and then, a gust of wind picks up, carrying with it the scent of sage and the whispered secrets of the land. Eventually, the reality of the situation sinks in. Here I am, alone in the vastness of the desert, with nothing but a mutilated John Doe for company. With the radio set to a nearby channel, every so often a burst of static or a distant voice reminds me of the world outside. But for the most part, it's just me, the body, and the waiting. But as the minutes turn into hours, an uneasy feeling settles in my gut, a nagging sensation that, despite the desolation, I'm not truly alone. It's as if the very air around me is charged, making the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. 
I can't shake the feeling of being watched. Just as the feeling becomes almost unbearable, a speck on the horizon catches my attention. Slowly, it grows larger and more defined. A single black SUV, its windows reflecting the blinding sun. This wasn't one of our vehicles, but the distinctive federal plates leave little to the imagination. I find myself surprised. The feds usually take their sweet time, often coming in after our team has done most of the work. The SUV's engine growls to a halt, dust settling around the tires. The door swings open and, to my surprise, only a single person steps out. Not a team of agents in dark suits and sunglasses like I've come to expect, but a singular figure. She's slight, with blonde hair pulled back in a neat ponytail, glasses perched on her nose, and an air of quiet intensity. I would have taken her for a librarian rather than an FBI agent. She closes the door with a soft thud and immediately heads toward me, one hand adjusting her glasses while the other clutches a leather-bound notebook. There's a determination in her stride that's intriguing. Stopping a few paces from me, she reaches into her pocket, pulling out a badge, flashing it momentarily. Special Agent Isabel Ramirez, she says, her voice even and calm. I'm the FBI liaison for this region. I thought there would be. More of you, I say, raising an eyebrow. She smirks, a hint of amusement in her steely blue eyes. Yeah, I get that a lot. Due to budget cuts, I work alone a lot. I nod, understanding her situation probably better than most. I try my best to quell my underlying resentment. Sergeant Logan Tohanny, Tribal Police, I say, extending a hand, but you can just call me Logan. She seems to consider this for a moment before giving a firm handshake. All right, Logan, call me Izzy. Izzy then. I try to keep my tone light, pushing back the gravity of the situation for just a moment. So, what do they teach you about the desert at Quantico? She chuckles softly. Nothing, actually, but I've had my share of cases out here. Her gaze drifts momentarily to the cordoned off area, eyes narrowing behind her glasses. I glance at the scene, a weight settling on my chest. This one's different, I say, my voice barely above a whisper. She takes a deep breath, composing herself. Let me see it. I lead Izzy over to the cordoned off area, watching her reaction closely. She seems unfazed, her eyes scanning the scene with a practiced, clinical precision. She walks around the perimeter, taking it all in, occasionally scribbling down notes in a small leather-bound notebook. Izzy takes a moment, then crouches near the body, carefully avoiding disturbing the scene. Her face is impassive, professional, but I detect a hint of concern, perhaps even recognition. We had a Jane Doe in Flagstaff, she starts, gently prodding a portion of the exposed muscle with gloved fingers, just a week ago. Very similar. Her skin was removed just like this, and those symbols, she points to the grotesque carvings, they're nearly identical. I wasn't informed of any other murders, I reply, slightly taken aback. She shrugs. Jurisdictional complications? But when I got the details of your 419, I just knew they were related. I feel a cold chill run down my spine. So, what are we looking at? Some kind of serial killer? She nods, her eyes not leaving the body. Seems like it. Someone trying to send a message, or enact some ritual. We're still trying to decipher the exact significance. Pushing back the unease, I ask, any leads on the Flagstaff case? She straightens up, meeting my gaze. Not many. The victim was a young woman, no ties to the reservation, no obvious connections to any known criminal elements. It was a real mystery. Izzy takes a step back from the body and scans the ground, her eyes narrowing behind her glasses. Were those there when you arrived? She asks, 
nodding toward a series of bare footprints in the sand. I follow her gaze and my pulse quickens. Those footprints weren't there earlier. The unmistakable imprints of human feet with clearly defined toes and arches. They're fresh, I murmur, scanning the surroundings. The creeping sensation of being watched, which had been gnawing at me earlier, now feels even more palpable. We both follow the footprints, our steps deliberate and cautious. The tracks lead away from the crime scene, weaving through the rocky terrain towards the road. The human toes elongate, and the arch of the foot stretches. In the span of a few yards, they morph, slowly transforming from human to distinctly animal. They become the unmistakable tracks of a coyote. What the? Izzy murmurs, clearly shaken, why thoughts immediately drift to the legends of the Enald Lucii. Malevolent, which doctors capable of taking on different forms to wreak havoc and harm. But those were just tales told around campfires, before I can continue my train of thought. The radio at my hip crackles to life, its urgent chirping cutting through the silent tension. Sergeant Tohani, Mandy's voice breaks through, her tone urgent, you there? I fumble with the radio, pressing the talk button. I'm here. Go ahead. Logan, we've got a 5150 in Seji. Reports of an individual acting erratically, Mandy says, her voice tinged with concern. I exchange a glance with Izzy, our thoughts momentarily diverted from the bizarre scene before us. A 5150 is no ordinary disturbance. It usually indicates a mental health crisis or someone in severe distress. The timing can't have been a coincidence, given our current situation. They have to be connected. Copy that, Mandy. I respond, my voice tight with frustration. I'll head over there right away. I turn to Izzy. We exchange a final look, a silent agreement that whatever's happening in Seji is connected to this gruesome scene. You coming? I ask. She raises an eyebrow, a hint of determination in her eyes. Lead the way. The desert sprawls out in front of me as I navigate the rough terrain back to the cruiser. Izzy's SUV follows closely behind. The wind, a constant companion in the open land, whistles quietly as it kicks up small swirls of dust in our wake. I can't shake the unease simmering within me as we drive through the stark landscape towards Tseji, where an unknown situation awaits us. I pull up in front of the modest dwelling from where the call originated. Izzy parks a few feet behind and steps out, scanning the area cautiously. The house appears unassuming, a quaint abode amidst the vastness of the desert. The screen door sways gently, emitting a creaking sound that echoes faintly in the stillness of the night. Before we can approach, the front door creaks open. A woman emerges, her hair in disarray and eyes wild with a mixture of fear and recognition. It's Margaret Yazzie. I've known her for years. She's always been a sturdy, unshakable pillar in the community. To see her like this, frail and trembling, is unsettling. Logan, she gasps, her eyes locking onto mine with an intensity that belies her fragile demeanor. Maggie, I respond, instinctively moving towards her. What happened? As I get closer, I notice the worry lines etched deeply into her face. Her eyes flicker towards Izzy, a slight frown forming on her forehead. Who's this? Special Agent Isabel Ramirez, Izzy interjects smoothly, showing her batch. The FBI? Maggie asked nervously. She's helping with another case. I say quickly, trying to assuage her fears, but given the circumstances, we believe they might be related. Maggie's gaze shifts between Izzy and me, uncertainty clouding her eyes. All right, if you say so, Logan, she finally murmurs. Izzy's voice is soft but firm. May we come in? Maggie hesitates for a heartbeat, giving Izzy a once-over before finally nodding. Yeah, sure. As we step into the house, 
The scene that unfolds before us is chaotic. Furniture is overturned, vases and photo frames shattered on the ground, and curtains torn. It's as if a whirlwind has passed through the living area. Maggie wrings her hands, her gaze flitting over the destruction. I never thought I'd see my home like this, she says quietly, her voice quivering. Taking a deep breath, I gently ask, Maggie, can you tell us what happened? She swallows hard, eyes darting to the broken window. I was preparing dinner when I heard a noise outside. At first, I thought it was just the wind or some animals, but then I heard a thud, like someone trying to get in. Before I could even react, he was inside. He? Izzy questions. Maggie nods. A man, but not like any I've ever seen. His eyes were wild, almost glowing in the dim light, and his movements were erratic, like a wild animal trapped in a man's body. He didn't say anything, just made these guttural noises. Chills run down my spine as she describes the intruder. It sounds eerily similar to some of the old Navajo legends, but it's hard to believe such tales could be true. Did he harm you? Izzy asks, concern evident in her tone. Maggie shakes her head, her fingers absently touching her throat. No, he just ransacked the place. I hid in the pantry, praying he wouldn't find me. And after what felt like hours, he just left. Did you recognize him at all? I ask. She hesitates for a moment, her eyes distant. His features were obscured, but there was something oddly familiar about his presence. But I can't place it. Izzy kneels, examining the footprints left on the floor. The same elongated shape that transitions into a paw-like pattern. These prints, she murmurs, they're the same as the ones we found at the crime scene. Maggie shifts uncomfortably as Izzy. Her gaze flits between us, an unease growing in her eyes. I watch intently as Izzy's fingers trace the outline of the prints. The room is tense, the only sound the distant hum of a ceiling fan. A realization slowly dawns on me, a cold, sinking feeling in my stomach. The footprints lead into the house, but none lead out. If the intruder had come in but hadn't left, where was he now? My heart races and I instinctively reach for my sidearm. Izzy, sensing the shift in the atmosphere, quickly stands and locks eyes with me. We both scan the room, the weight of our earlier observations settling heavy on our shoulders. Maggie, I call out, trying to keep the tremor out of my voice, there's no response. The room is eerily silent, save for the soft hum of the ceiling fan above. My eyes dart to the back door, hoping she might have slipped out unnoticed, but the door remains firmly shut, with every instinct screaming at me. I cautiously approach the pantry where Maggie had said she'd hidden earlier. The door is slightly ajar, and I can see a dim light filtering from inside. I signal for Izzy to stay back as I slowly push the door open. The light from the pantry casts long, creeping shadows on the floor, painting the room in an eerie glow. As the door creaks open, a metallic scent, thick and suffocating, fills the air. The unmistakable smell of blood. Inside, a scene of pure horror unfolds. The walls are smeared with dark, fresh blood pooling onto the floor beneath a crumpled figure. It's a body, skin removed in a manner far too familiar, leaving only raw, bloody muscle. The ghastly sight churns my stomach while rising in my throat. The facial features, what little remain of them, are unrecognizable. But there's no doubt. The size, the clothing remnants, the jewelry. This is Maggie. Or, rather, what was left of her, I take a staggering step back, hand covering my mouth, trying to suppress a scream. Izzy, hearing my reaction, pushes past me to see the grotesque sight. Her face drains of color, 
her composed demeanor shattered by the unspeakable horror before her. The sudden realization that the Maggie we'd been talking to wasn't Maggie at all fills me with a deep, gut-wrenching dread. Every instinct screams at me to move, to react, but I'm paralyzed, locked in a trance by the horrific sight before me. A chilling whisper dances in the air, making the tiny hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. You shouldn't have come here. It hisses to I whip around, eyes darting across the room to locate the source of the voice. That's when I see her, or rather, it, a grotesque parody of Maggie. Her once soft features are twisted in a cruel mockery, eyes gleaming a feral yellow, her mouth twisted in an inhuman snarl, displaying teeth that are far too sharp. Without warning, she lunges at Izzy, who's still standing by the pantry entrance. Her movements are swift, unpredictable, and unervingly silent. Izzy, caught off guard, barely manages to sidestep, avoiding a swipe that would have likely ripped her throat open. The imposter's momentum carries her into the pantry, crashing into the blood-smeared walls. Using the momentary distraction, I draw my gun, but my hands tremble, my sights blurring from the adrenaline pumping through my veins, before I can steady myself and take aim. The imposter Maggie is on the move again, her form blurring as she darts towards me. A powerful force hits me square in the chest, sending me sprawling onto the ground. My gun skids out of reach, and I'm left defenseless. She straddles me, her grotesque visage inches from mine, the foul stench of decay assaulting my nostrils. Her fingers, tipped with nails that resemble razor-sharp claws, dig into my shoulders, pinning me down. The weight of the imposter pressing down on me is suffocating, and I can feel the icy chill of her breath against my face. Through the haze of fear, I catch a glimpse of Izzy to my side, her sidearm trained on the imposter, her expression a mask of concentration. But I can see the uncertainty in her eyes. She's trying to find a clear shot without risking hitting me. Shoot! I gasp out, feeling the imposter's claws start to pierce the skin on my shoulders, warm blood trickling down. But the creature's unpredictable movements and our proximity to each other make it impossible for Izzy to get a clear line of sight. The creature's eyes, a kaleidoscope of predatory focus, seem to see through me, into my very soul. Her grin stretches revealing rows of teeth that look sharp enough to tear through bone with ease. As I watch, those teeth inch closer, dripping with a dark liquid that I can only assume is blood. But then, a memory flashes into my mind. The taser, clipped to my belt and forgotten in the heat of the moment. With all the strength I can muster, I manage to free one arm, reaching desperately for the device. I feel the cool metal in my grip just as the creature leans in, her grotesque mouth opening impossibly wide, ready to take a bite. Without hesitation, I jam the taser into her side and squeeze the trigger. A deafening crack fills the air as the taser unloads its charge, arcs of electricity dancing across her body. The creature screams, a sound so shrill and inhuman it's almost deafening. Her grip on me loosens, her body convulsing with the force of the shock. Izzy, seizing the opportunity, fires her gun. The shot rings out loud and clear. The bullet grazes the creature's shoulder, sending a spray of dark, thick blood splattering across the room. With another guttural scream, the creature pushes off me, scrambling away with an unnatural speed. Its movements are erratic, a blend of human desperation and animalistic panic. Before Izzy can fire another shot, the creature lunges at her with startling speed, knocking her off her feet with a powerful shove. The impact sends her crashing into a nearby bookshelf, books and keepsakes raining down around her. The creature doesn't linger, instead darting towards the broken window and leaping out in a single bound. 
The silence that follows is deafening. Panting, I pull myself up into a sitting position, trying to process what just happened. The stench of blood, both mine and the creature's, fills my nostrils, and the metallic taste coats my tongue Why eyes darts to Izzy. She groans, slowly trying to get to her feet, clutching her arm where it had made contact with the hard wooden edge of the bookshelf. Blood trickles down from a fresh gash on her temple. Are you okay? I manage to ask, though my own voice sounds distant, as if from a far-off dream. Izzy nods weakly, taking a deep breath. Yeah, I think so. What? What the hell was that? I shake my head, unable to find the words to describe the impossible events we just witnessed. The stories of shapeshifters, tales I'd grown up hearing, seemed all too real now. I don't know, I admit, my voice trembling, but we need to find it.